little something for the ladies. Now I'm also available on alternative social media on MeWe, James Desborough, all one word, on Minds, Grimachu. I'm no longer on Gab, I've deleted my account because it's even more exhausting than Twitter. Oi. I have been reading this. Vital Beauty, Reclaiming Aesthetics in the Tangle of Technology and Nature. And it's been a bit of a slog. Uh, now I know you want me to cut to the chase and just review the book, which very few of you will be interested in, but on this channel we take our time, we contextualise things, and you know, we take things a, a little bit more slowly and examine them in more depth. Now, I used to read a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot, and that has been slipping by the wayside over the over the last few years. Um, work is writing and reading and rereading, and research. Yeah, I do a lot of reading for that. So recreational reading has just been kind of let slide, and so I'm trying to make time, force myself to spend at least a little bit of time reading every single day to get back into the into the swing of it. Because I used to love it. I used to devour books once got through the entire Lord of the Rings in two days. That's, that's how much I used to read. And it, it's good for your own writing to read. Um, and I seem to have picked something particularly difficult <laughs> to read to start with. And if you follow this channel at all, if you follow me on social media at all, you know I don't have a great deal of respect for philosophy. I consider philosophy to be virtually as useless as religion. Where philosophy is perhaps useful is in mapping out you know, areas of vagueness that science can then follow up on and give us actual answers to. And similarly, while I studied art, I did not end up pursuing that as a career, and when I was studying art, I made deliberate efforts to avoid art history and critical analysis and just to concentrate on the, the actual doing of art. It's been very useful in my career when I hire artists and so on, and, and I think I have a good visual aesthetic uh, for the things for the things that I do. So yeah, the, the first book <laughs> that I read in the year is basically a collection of philosophical essays and treatises on the nature of beauty and art. So combining those two things that I <laughs> haven't really liked very much. So yeah, it was a slog. Uh, Capsule review, mostly gibberish. Sturgeon's law very much ap applies here. Um, so the idea is that it's trying to uh, define, understand, and map aesthetics and beauty in this new world in which we find ourselves, where technology and nature collide. You know, what is vitalism? What is vitality? What, what is this quality? How how is it manifest? So there's some historical essays, some modern essays, some some studies, and so on. So what what is beauty? It's both easy and very difficult to define. Human beings tend to react well to symmetry and cleanliness, uh, bright colours, things like that, right? And it's easy to see the evolutionary psychological path by which we might have evolved to recognise these things as, as beauty in another human face. Symmetry, for example, in fruit, bright colours, uh, yeah, the, the bright kind of smell. Some of these things seem to come in naturally. Some of them have to be learned. Like you have to be taught to hate the smell of shit, for example. That's not something that comes naturally. As anyone who's had a toddler who's played with their own poop will know all too, all too well. And there are certain qualities that seem to transcend all cultural and national boundaries in, in art. There are things that people like. There are studies that have been done. If you want to do the absolute most milk toast, most surface level popular art you could think of, what you need to have is a, a pretty, mostly natural landscape with some people doing something in it. And that's consistently and constantly rated the most highly by the general public around the world. So that, that there is a common human concept of aesthetic. But then culture kind of gets in the way and analysis and interaction. You know, you, someone tapes a banana to a wall, most of us dismiss that as, as not art. The people who are educated in art, perhaps, you know, about Duchamp or you know, the, the various modern semi-anarchistic uh, small-a art movements that, that have gone on, 
to reality and so on they could they can analyze it and they can try to figure it out and realize what the artist intended right but you have to be educated to appreciate that kind of art and you don't necessarily get educated the same way you're not necessarily going to agree it's it's non-representative it is is the issue so delving into the book the, the useful parts between the postmodernist <laughs> nonsense, uh, there are some diagrams which I thought were actually quite interesting and useful for mapping art. So you have a sort of configuration space in which art can exist. So an, an aesthetic can be neat, but if it's too neat, it becomes monotonous. It can be ugly, but if it's too ugly, it becomes too chaotic and off putting. Uh, if it's too complex, then people find it incomprehensible whereas if it's too simple people find it dull and superficial so that there's a there's a sort of sweet spot space in which art can exist but your taste may not map to any of these particular things and there's various incarnations of this chart for example you can you can think of examples I think if ugly things can be beautiful or at least can be aesthetic if you think about um, a horror movie makeup or something that's really intricate and well done you could admire the craftsmanship you can appreciate the the sensations of disgust or fear or whatever else they, they might be bringing out in you but real violence someone's real leg torn apart it goes too far um, similarly some, something pretty like a nice little cottage in the country can we can all appreciate the beauty of that well, most of most of us probably can but when they surround it with garden gnomes and other other tat, it, it becomes twee, and that's too much that way. If you take a simple thing and blow it up to an enormous size, like a like a cube or something, you, you blow that up massively and paint it a bright primary colour, that can become art just through the sheer scale of it, even though it's something really simple. Or if you carve something mundane like a Monopoly piece out of a grain of rice, the, the smallness can make it beauty. So there's all these different interacting forces, but they all exist within this space that we can say is, is, the, is the configuration space of, of beauty or at least aesthetic appeal. Um, there's some of the essays in this which treat vitality as some sort of ineffable quintessence of life. There's a, there's a theological definition of vitality which does absolutely nothing for me obviously <laughs> and then there is a more scientific way of looking at it and then somewhere in between is the idea that vitality comes about through motion and interaction a lot of art is very static I mean reading there is the act of reading so you're moving through the story so there is a there is a vitality there computer games react to what you do and you react to what they do and there's a feedback loop and so that's an interactive and, and vital art form but even paintings can be vitalistic if you think about the impressionists or other art that is representative just partially abstracted even when people are really trying to represent the reality there it's imperfect and so you your brain and your mind is engaged in trying to interpret the artwork as reality it's almost as if you your eyesight has gotten worse and you have to squint to, to pick something out. It takes extra processing time, so there is an amount of interaction there. But this, this new definition of, of vitality, of life, in art, very much seems to be centred around this, or well, this concept, at least in the parts that I liked, seems to be centred around this idea of interactivity and, and meaning. So it's the interaction with the art that is the place in which art takes place, if you will. It's your interpretation, your reaction, your interaction, the meaning that you layer upon it. So from that context, something like a meme is, is high art, really. You're taking something that already exists with a certain amount of meanings, you're mixing it up with other meanings, and it exists contextually in time, but it's very fleeting. But that view of vitality um, a non-mystical, non-theological concept of, of vitalism, uh, of being current and interactive and moving and changing. That makes sense to me. And then 
one the the one section of the book that I really really liked uh, was an interview with Arjen Mulder. Um, sorry, interview by Arjen Mulder with uh, Professor Daniel N. Stern. Uh, psychology rather rather than social studies. So wibbly wobbly, but not quite as wibbly wobbly as uh, as other things. And he's trying to define vitality and life without recourse to these uh, religious definitions and he believes that 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 sense of life that we get from a, a human body when it's alive and what's absent when it's dead is a whole host of subconscious cues the slight rise and fall of the chest the sound of the breath the pupils focusing and, and refocusing constantly that there is something there in living beings in living things that we detect subconsciously that we recognize as life so the life vitality is this emergent quality of interacting systems that we may not even be consciously aware of so what, what do i take from all this well you know i i work in interactive art games uh, i write that's interactive just to a lesser extent and uh, my collaborator on a lot of recent projects, Rachel Haywire, is into this whole vitalism thing. So I wanted to get some kind of insights into that. Uh, unfortunately, about 90% of the book was crap, <laughs> which conforms with Sturgeon's Law. A lot of it was absolute nonsense, extremely difficult to read, even harder to extract any meaning from. But there's a few bits and pieces there. Give me, Give me an idea of what that this configuration space of art can be and a secular vision of vitality which suggests to me that I need to encourage more interactivity and to try and exploit rather than to resist the way in which art and the artist and the context against your will and uh, without your intent ends up being jumbled up that there's no real escape from it particularly not in this technological world in which we exist but it doesn't actually answer any of the questions <laughs> that it really sets out to to ask you know what is beauty something purely utilitarian can be beautiful there is there is a, a beauty and efficiency in form following function you know a bulldozer can be beautiful uh, a wasp sting can be beautiful you know these are things that are designed in one case deliberately in the other case evolutionarily to do some one particular thing you know? and what I found encouraging in the book was it seemed to regard with scorn the divide between high and low art do you know why should a science fiction novel be treated with disdain by the same people who will worship a meandering literary work that goes nowhere does nothing and just it just exists um, without without any real meaning or, or, or point to it you know there's there's no storytelling there it's, and they're often extremely obtuse at least for for most of us the uh, last thing that I really took from this um, I've read quite a bit of Kafka somehow I'd missed this but Kafka has this story, this thing in it called an Odradek, which is a seemingly useless and pointless object that doesn't really do anything and defies analysis. And that seems to have been a joke on people who had analysed the work, but that, that story and that, that concept of the Odradek is, um, is fascinating. And I, I think you should, you should all go and, go and read more Kafka. On to the next book, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that was a rough start to the year. Zang. Postmortem Studios sells a wide variety of stock art, well over 500 pieces, many of them by RPG industry veteran Brad McDevitt. These are available for you to use in your personal or professional projects, whether stories or games or anything else. Check us out at rpgnow.com.